Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 22nd episode of Patterson in Pursuit. I am your host, Steve Patterson, and today we are going to infinity and beyond. Well, that's not actually quite true. My brain can't even go to infinity, so we're trying to just get to infinity, much less beyond it. This week's interview was conducted in Oxford, England, where I spoke with a philosopher of mathematics about infinity. If you're familiar with my position on this topic or any of my writing, you know I have a tough time with infinity. To help me sort out my confusion, I had a conversation with Dr. Daniel Isaacson, who teaches the philosophy of mathematics at Oxford. This is his area of expertise. Interesting note about Oxford, of all the places that I've gone so far, of all the universities I've been to, the individuals I've spoken with, I was by far most impressed with Oxford. I have a very negative opinion of academia and academicians in general, but my skepticism was pleasantly overcome just through the conversations that I had with people at Oxford. That includes my previous interview with Dr. Timothy Williamson, we talked about logic, and Dr. Simon Saunders, where we talked about quantum physics. Unfortunately, I do think that Oxford might be one of the few exceptions to the rule, especially given that I only spoke with a few academicians there. But if you are like me and didn't get to go to Oxford, and you're currently enrolled in a college that you're just not impressed with, maybe your fellow students are disappointing you and the professors are disappointing you, I strongly urge you to check out a program called Praxis. They're the sponsor for the show, and they specialize in taking young and independent minds and putting them straight into the real world, skipping college altogether. Praxis lands you a paid apprenticeship. They teach you real-world job skills, and after you complete their program, they guarantee you a $40,000 a year job offer. And the net cost to you of all of this is $0. So if that sounds like an alternative that you want, then head over to discoverpraxis.com and click on their Schedule a Call button. You can talk to them, see if it's a fit. And I know the founders of this company. I give them the highest marks. I know several people who have gone through the program, and everybody is raving about it. So give them a call and see what you think. One of the more general criticisms that I have of academia is kind of a methodological one. It's not unique to any particular branch of thought, but you see it in mathematics, you see it in physics, you see it in economics, you see it in political theory, and it has to do with what might be an overlooking of the foundations of a particular discipline. I think if you get the foundations inaccurate, then the rest of your entire theory built on the inaccurate foundations is also going to be inaccurate. What's interesting is that I suspect in mathematics there is more work that needs to be done in regards to the foundations. There was an utter existential crisis around the turn of the 20th century In mathematics, there were a lot of different competing schools of thought offering different mutually exclusive foundations for mathematics, and I think the group that won made a couple of important errors. One of them has to do with infinity. The other has to do with the metaphysics of mathematics. What are numbers? Mathematicians talk about numbers all the time. What are those types of things? So I love this interview that you're about to hear with Dr. Isaacson of Oxford because at the end, after we have a good back and forth for about a half an hour or so, he essentially says that if my conception of mathematics is correct, then pretty much all professional mathematics for the last century has been foundationally flawed. And most people, because they're reasonable, would say, oh, well, therefore that probably means my own idea is wrong. It couldn't be the case that an entire profession has been making errors for a century. But because I'm completely unreasonable and bullheaded, my suspicion is, hmm, I think actually it might be the case that professional mathematicians have been wrong for a century. But you'll have to listen to it and decide for yourself. There's a great deal more to say on this particular topic, but I really hope you enjoy my interview with Dr. Isaacson, who teaches the philosophy of mathematics at Oxford University. In the world of mathematics, a central concept is that of a infinite set or a completed infinity. Mm. Um, what I struggle with is this idea, just purely conceptually, when you think of a completed infinity, it smacks me of uh, an impossibility that you could mm. never have a completed infinity. Mm. So what I'd like to do is lay out just my own understanding of what we mean by the term infinite. Mm. And if that's wrong, then uh, please correct me, and then I'll ask you a question. So when I use the term infinite or infinity, what I mean is never-ending or mm. Mm. never completed or without boundaries, something mm. like that. Is that a fair? Mm. Which is why the Greeks had that notion of infinity. Do you think that? Do you think that that is a good way, a healthy way, a proper way of thinking Unbounded, about? Unbounded. Yeah. Yes. So how could it be then? that you have... It's a conception of infinity. It's not the only one. Right. <laughs> okay, well, maybe we can talk about that, too. So with that conception of infinity, 
it seems like simply by analyzing our concepts, you couldn't have a infinite set because a set implies it's something that's boundary, that it is, mm. it is something mm. that's definite. So can you help me? How could it be that you have an infinite set in the first place? Right. Well, I mean, that's why we need different notions of infinity. On that conception of infinity, yes, there are no completed infinites. I mean, this was one of um, Aristotle's very great insights. I mean, Aristotle says there are all infinity is potential, not actual. Right. Um, and that's a very important idea which has persisted to the present day, and there are people who still take that view. For example, I mentioned intuitionism, uh, the approach to mathematics developed by, in particular, the Dutch mathematician L.E.J. Brouwer. Um, but that's not the only way to understand infinity. Um, Another way to understand infinity, or rather one should say to understand infinite structures or infinite sets, is in terms of the structure that is infinite. What does that mean? So if you take, for example, the natural numbers, if you think of the natural numbers as generated by producing the next one and the next one and the next one, mm -hmm. um, that will never get you to a completed in infinite, right? right? And, but it'll get you to infinity. I mean, a child who's learning arithmetic has this great moment when they realize that it goes on and on and that they're not, there's no limit. There are infinitely many numbers. That's a great moment of discovery. Oh, well, so, so what if I challenge that? And I say uh, there aren't infinite. Challenge. So what if I say this? That's a, what I would actually say not just playing devil's advocate here, what I would actually say is, I think that is a confusion about the nature of numbers. It's not no. that there are an infinite amount of numbers out there. Numbers are something that have a conceptual existence. They exist when we conceive of them. So to say there are infinite amount of numbers implies that they're out there. That they're, they're out no, there. No, it doesn't. Oh, it doesn't. I mean, it's just what you said. I mean, you said infinity was when you can go on and on, and that's the nature of numbers. You okay. Oh, well, that's very different. If we say you can go on and on. Yeah, that's all it, I meant. But that's a very, yeah, that is a very, very different conception. But I'm saying that's conception. not the only conception, but that's your conception of infinity, and that's a perfectly okay one. But, uh, so what's the, what's the alternative, though? So, well, the alternative, or an alternative, is to say I'm thinking about the natural numbers, and they are not some bunch of things. I'm not, I, in fact, I, I think it's totally, totally misguided to think of natural numbers as a bunch of things. That would be, I mean, that's indefensible ultimately. But um, that one is thinking about a certain structure. And it, what is the nature of that structure? It's a structure in which there is a two place relation of next. And that two-place relation is one-to-one -one so that no two things have the same next thing. Yes, and but doesn't that imply then that these numbers are out there? So no, no. no. We're talking about prop conceptual properties. Okay, so it... it so let me try to rephrase that, and if this is an incorrect way of what you're saying, then please correct me. What you're saying is that another way of thinking about infinity is that it is almost a statement about the generation, let's say, of sets. So for example, we can come up with what an, infi what an infinite set means has to do with how you generate the set and how there's no... No, that's not no, what I'm that's saying. Not what you're that's saying. what okay. you're saying. Yeah. Okay. I'm not saying that. Okay. <laughs> I'm saying that a different way to think about the natural numbers okay. is to think about the structure that they, if you like, constitute. What do you, that's the part that I'm not, I guess right. I don't understand. What, oh, is, I, what do you I'm mean by a structure? You. Okay. <laughs> so there are certain fundamental properties that characterize that structure. We can, we need, first of all, we need a language in which to express these properties. And then with that language, we can express the conditions that characterize it. But when you use the term structure, I don't even have my head wrapped around what you mean by structure. No, that is a difficult notion, I agree. But um, just bear with me. Okay. So 
suppose we have a language, but not suppose we just give ourselves a language in which we have a symbol for, which we'll call zero, which just is the, call it, let's let it be the usual old symbol of zero, okay. and let S be a function symbol, that okay. is, it applies to something that gives us something. Okay. And the intended meaning is that S of X is the next natural number. But we don't talk about natural numbers. We just have zero and successor. And then we write down as an axiom that uh, for every x and y, um, if the successor of x equals the successor of y, then x equals y, which is to say that s is one-to-one -one mapping, right? OK. Um, and then we also say that 0 is not the successor of anything. OK. That's, you can just write that in the language. For all x, s of x not equal 0. Um, and then we add another axiom, which says that, and this is a second order axiom, because we're quanti quantifying over the elements of the domain, the, the collections of elements of the domain. For any collection of elements in the domain, if it contains 0 and is closed under the S operation, then it contains everything. Yeah, what, what do you mean by everything, though? It's just, I use a quantifier. I say, for every x, well, for every c, let's say c is a collection of things. If 0 is in c, mm -hmm. and uh, for every y, if y is in c, then s of y is in c. Right? Okay. I'm saying it's closed under successor. Okay. Then, for every x, x is in c. Yes, but... I don't understand the connection between that and infinity. All right, I'll explain it. Okay. <laughs> so I'm jumping ahead here. So those three axioms mm -hmm. characterize the structure of the natural numbers. Okay. Uh, un understood as products of our conception. You can right. think of that as a yes. product of our conception. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm not saying there are things. I'm just saying this is what it is to be okay. that structure. It okay. starts with zero, and it goes on and on and on, and it has nothing else in it. That's what we're saying. So the first, you, if, you th if you have the successor operation, it goes you from one thing to another, mm -hmm. right? The first axiom that zero is, so how, if you have a successor operation, you start with zero, you have the successor of zero, the successor of the successor of zero, and so on, right? Those things might not be the natural, the structure of the natural numbers in two ways. Well, in three ways they might not be, and that's what exactly this axiom is, these three axioms guarantee doesn't happen, and then you get exactly that in structure of the natural numbers, something that starts with zero and goes on and on and on, step by step. And the uh, first condition is that, well, how could it f end up not being the intended infinite structure? Well, it might circle back on itself to zero, or it might circle back on itself to some non-zero element. The axiom that says zero is not the successor of anything guarantees that it doesn't circle back to zero. Okay. And the one-to-one -one condition for all x, x, y, if s of x equals s of y, then x equals y, tells you that you don't get two things that both get their successors taken to the same thing, i.e., that sequence doesn't circle back to some other point, some non-zero point. Okay. And then the last condition is that there shouldn't be anything extraneous, right? You, that, those two axioms tell you that you have zero and you have the successor and the successor, and they're all different. And you, so that's those, anything that satisfies those conditions contains the structure that we think of as the natural numbers, but then we need something that tells us that there's nothing else in that structure, and that's what the last axiom does. That's the, well, the principle of induction. And with those properties, we then know what it is to be the structure of the natural numbers, and we can take the, the natural numbers to be what is characterized by those axioms. So, so let me... And there's nothing potential about it. It's those three axioms at once tell us what we are talking about. 
Okay, so for me, and in listening to that, it sounds like what you've done is accurately described or characterized the nature of a certain group of numbers. Well, not a group of numbers. I mean, or you, you a certain structure. The natural. That structure of the natural numbers. Yes, but it, but to, so to me, that sounds like a very precise definition. Like that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the natural numbers. Mm -hmm. But can you make the connection? So if I, if I agree with that, I say okay, let, let's let's say that conceptually speaking, when we talk about the natural numbers, this is what it is. Can you help me see the connection between that and? an infinite set. When you're talking about an infinite set, are you simply s referencing like this type of thing, which is the natural number? So it's not that it's actually some set that has an inf a non-finite amount of ele elements in it. It's just you're talking about one group of things, which are the natural numbers. Anything that satisfies these axioms is an infinite collection. An infinite in, in what sense? So. Well, all right, in what sense? Well, in the sense that, um, well, the, of course, we have to say what we mean by infinite. Right. I mean, so um, one definition of infinite, and it's slightly, it's not exactly plain sailing to prove that it, this satisfies it, but that can be done, um, would be to say that a set is infinite if there's one-to-one -one correspondence between it and a proper subset of itself. Okay, but all of the proofs that I've seen, the, the diagonal correspondence proofs, and they, they have to do with this one-to-one -one correspondence, but in all of them I think they incorporate my definition of infinity, which is, and this continues on ad infinitum. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is that if we acknowledge that you can't actually have an infinite set with that conception of infinity, what I'm saying is, what is this alternative conception of infinity? So it, it seems like what we established at the beginning is, if it's the case that what in infinite means is actually never ending, mm -hmm. then you can't have an infinite set. But so you said there's an alternative. You can't have an actually infinite set. Of course, you have infinite sets. They're just potentially infinite. Okay. What I would say is, I don't think. Or oh, you're a strict finitist. Do you think that there's... Well, it's not that I'm a strict finitist. Is that, well, I mean, I, I, there are I, only I may... finite in many things. Well, what I would say is this. When we're talking about a set, mm -hmm. we are talking about something that is definite, that is, def that is defined. It's not... We're talking about a set. It's not something and then more than what's in it. It is something that is concrete. And it seems like... Concrete. Well, I, maybe concrete isn't a, a precise word, but it is boundaried. There's boundaries around it when we're talking about a set. Okay. So, and if that's the case, if that is built into the concept of set, mm -hmm. then it seems like you definitely cannot have an infinity that is incorporated into that set. So when we're talking about, you know, one-to-one -one correspondence, mm -hmm. that seems to incorporate this actually never-ending idea into it. And so what I'm trying to do is identify what is this alternative definition of infinity, because it, cause when, when you're... Is there a way that you can explain not my definition of infinity, but your definition of infinity without including like one to one correspondence? No. <laughs> okay. Well that seems so that, that this is maybe my sticking point, is that I when looking at one to one correspondence, it seems to incorporate my definition of of infinity. I don't know what you mean by your definition of infinity. I mean, you have a notion of infinite as potentially infinite. Nothing you've said says there's no other notion of infinity. I don't, and I don't reject your notion of infinity. Right, right. no, what I'm, I, I'm not saying But that. I don't know why you're rejecting anything else. It's not that I'm rejecting it, it's that I'm trying to fully wrap my head around it. So mm -hmm. I, I still, I, I still, for whatever reason, can't do that. So hmm. it seems like, so, so let, let's, let's walk through just piece by piece again, exactly, just for my own sake, to try to grasp this. We've established that when we talk, when we use the term infinite hmm. in the sense that actually never ending, you don't have any infinite sets. I would say it doesn't even. Oh, mean any uh, actually infinite sets. Maybe I could put it this way hmm. the idea of a potentially infinite set doesn't really make that much conceptual sense because it's not actually, it's not really 
potentially infinite because at no point would you ever say, ah, you have an infinite set. So it's not, there's not even the potentiality for it, right? Well, I mean, Aristotle makes the distinction that um, the potential infinity of the numbers is not like the potential existence of the statue and the block of marble. Mm -hmm. So the block of marble is there and the potential statue inside it, as it were, exists as concretely as the block of marble, you might think. Okay. Um, it's not like that, right? It's a, the potentiality is something that is in progress. It is in progress, but not really, because in progress Im implies that at some point you've, you've generated an infinite set, which is no, not even why, something that can be done. It possibly, it doesn't mean that at all. I mean, it just means you can go on and on and on. That's the nature of infinity. Yes, I agree. I agree you can go on and on and on, but that doesn't mean that you're in progress of generating an infinite maybe set. Maybe we're at cross-purposes yeah. here, okay. actually, from your questions. I mean, okay. maybe you're a strict finitist. Maybe you think that there, everything is finite, and there's a limit to how big anything can be. Now, just a minute. Sure, so, sure. Um, there are strict finitists. I think they have a pretty miserable time of it. <laughs> uh, but... You know, you can, with heroic measures, uh, try to be a strict finitist. There's a Russian mathematician, uh, Yesenin Volpin, who advocated this, and indeed a colleague of mine, Robin Gandhi, explored it. I don't think he was quite an advocate of it, but you can take the idea that um, we, you could, for example, it's a, tr it's a fact that um, there is that, that if you think of numbers as given by numerals, strings of symbols, right? A numeral is a concatenation of a certain number of digits. Um, there is a biggest numeral that's ever, in terms of, well, even in terms of length, there's the biggest numeral that's ever been written down. Yes. And yes. probably, I mean, indeed, I mean, as far as that goes, I mean, we know the, the universe, or anyway, we know the, the, the Earth is going to be destroyed at some point, probably will be destroyed long before then, but anyway. Um, so there's going to be a biggest one, right? At any point in time, yes. No, but even ultimately, at all times, if we're in terms of human beings anyway. Um, that well, sure, I think that's the same thing, to say at any point in time, at all times. Yeah, there, yeah. yeah, we'll come to an end. Sure. So, um, at the same time, I don't know, maybe you accept that but you don't accept that for every natural number there's a larger natural number well but here it's the way it's the phrasing of statements like that which i think i'm very i i can't get my head around or, mm -hmm. I, or I think there's an error there yeah. so to say for any natural number there is a larger natural number right that implies at least in the way that i hear those words that it's out there. Prior to our conception of it, it's out there. Versus, here's how I would like to rephrase it. Mm -hmm. For any number you conceive of, mm -hmm. you can conceive of a larger number. All right, do it like that. <laughs> but if that's the case, then that means there, there is no such thing as like an infinite cardinality. Like that, that concept wouldn't even make sense. Look, I mean, you accept that principle as you just formulated it? That? For every number that you can conceive of, you can conceive of a larger one. And I'm, I would make an, an, an addition to say, and that number that you conceive of does not exist prior to its conception. That's what I would say. So all sets are Look, necessarily finite. You used a very dangerous word there, can, right? That's okay. a modal word. Okay. You didn't say does exist, you said can exist. Because what I'm saying is sets do not exist separate of our conception. Therefore, okay. when you conceive of a set, it is finite. But this notion of can conceive, what do you mean by that? What I mean is that, just like any other concept, I'll take this as a t totally non-mathematical analogy. Mm -hmm. uh, just, Analogies are dangerous, but <laughs> try it. So when J.K. Rowling was writing her book about Harry Potter, she had the ability to conceive of alternative characters that were in the book. She had the ability to say Harry Potter had a different eye color than he did. There was the potential to have that kind of conception. Prior to that conception, and if she never had that conception, those characters wouldn't have any type of existence. Mm, okay. That's what I mean. 
so this is so importing that back into mathematics that you can conceive of a set of any given size, but you cannot conceive of a set of an infinite size. That the idea of an infinite I'm size itself. I'm happy with that. That's perfectly okay. That's the notion of potential infinity. I don't know what we're arguing about here. So what we what we would be arguing about is the idea that you could have a completed infinity. But you keep jumping to, I'm. Yeah. But do, you, do you see what I'm? No, I don't. I mean, I'm giving an account of completed in, uh, a completed infinite. That is the the structure of the natural numbers. That as a structure, but, in a way that does not in any way turn on changing your conception. Your conception is fine. It's a certain conception of infinity which you can make use of as much as you like. But I don't see anything in what in your advocacy of that conception that prevents someone else from having okay. another conception. So, so let's of go on. Let's go on to this question because maybe it will elicit maybe where my where I'm getting hung up, hung up on. There is an idea that people talk about different sizes of mm. infinite sets. Can we talk about that? How in with your conception? Mm. Not with my conception. Because my conception, I can say, obviously, this is an impossibility to, to even well, say. Well, actually, that's not even size. true. That's not even true. Okay. With the notion of potential infinity, but not strict finitism. That, I think, is, is I hope, off the table. Not but, necessarily. <laughs> okay. Well, then we may have to go back to that. But okay. if you treat infinity as potential infinity, then that is the position, for example, that was uh, advocated by Brouwer, in developing intuitionism, and um, he, I mean, initially he thought that there was only countable infinity, potential countable infinity, and so no different, no two sizes of infinity. But he was also, in fact, a, a great mathematician, and he realized however much he was willing to change mathematics to give up the calculus, to give up the continuum, to give up the properties of mathematical analysis was just too much. And so, he, so before, if you, I'm sorry if I may interrupt you, just so our listeners understand, well, it, it seems to be that you have to have some uh, particular conception of infinity when you're talking about calculus, when you're talking about curves, because you, you kind of almost incorporate infinities into curves, right, in order to get to generate a proper, a perfect curve, if you will. So I just right. want to say that, so yes. continue. So um, you can think of a curve in um, a two-dimensional curve, let's say, um, as a function that takes a point to another point. Right? If you have um, an x-y axis, let's just think of it like that. And let's think of it as, you know, something like a, a parabola, x equals y squared, or y equals x squared, I guess is the more usual way we use the variables. So y equals x squared. So for every x, you square it, and you get another point. And that gives you a parabola mm -hmm. in, in the plane. Um, now, what that is, is a mapping from something that is, well, we have to ask ourselves, what is, the, what is a point? What is a point? What is a point? <laughs> well, so one way to think of it, what is classically considered to be, is a point, a real number, which is a point uh, given by a real number, is an infinite decimal expansion or infinite binary expansion or whatever. Doesn't... That's one way okay. of thinking of okay. it. Okay. Okay. Now, that would be anathema to Brouwer. He couldn't take it because that makes a real number, an infinite object. Right, which right. doesn't seem to make sense to, to my... No, not, he, he rejected that idea. So what he realized was that he could develop the theory of functions on the real line, functions from the real numbers into the real numbers, by taking real numbers, which we think of as infinite objects, as potentially infinite. So that what it was to be a real number was to be an infinitely proceeding sequence of digits, or an infinitely proceeding series of rational numbers that approximate it. Okay, well, those are two very different those are two very different things. So No they're so, not. So so for example, if we're talking about curves, 
Yeah. It's one thing to say that, like we were talking about calculus, this is actually my position, which is no, I'm not aware of anybody that agrees with me, but um, do you need to incorporate infinities into calculus in order to be able to use calculus? Um, and what I would say is no, mm -hmm. because all of the calculations ultimately are finite and terminate. So you can have a curve as smooth as you like. That's very different from saying you have a perfect curve, if you will. Mm -hmm. Right. So that, that's what it's. So when we're talking about approximation, my position is in reality, everything terminates. So there is in reality, it's not the case that space is infinitely divisible or anything like that. Mm. So all of the calculations ultimately do terminate, though they terminate at whatever point you like, at whatever degree of specificity that mm. you like. All right. Do you, you, do you, what do you think about that? <laughs> to, but anyway, to get we're talking it. about terminating at a de degree of specificity. What, what, where do you terminate it? Wherever you like. That's what I'm saying. That, that's what we were saying, approximation. I'm saying, you know, you can be as precise. That's, this is my conception of if we want to rescue the concept of infinity, it simply means that you can go as large as you well, like or rescue, as small as you like. I don't know if that's like. the right word, but anyway, <laughs> if you want to hold to yours. Yes. Um, so what did Brouwer do? I mean, so Brouwer had this idea of a real number, though, which we would think of as an infinite thing. By itself, it's an infinite object. A natural number, a counting number, is a finite thing, right? But a real number is an infinite thing. But see, I, I, what do you mean? On the classical conception. Now, Brouwer's idea was you can make the real number manageable on his, well, as one would say, constructivist conception by making it something that you are in the process of generating at all times. It's never finished. It's never a completed infinite. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, that's a perfectly manageable notion. Now, what does that do to our development of the calculus? Well, it does something very specific. It means that all the functions that we can ever develop in our theory will be continuous. Now, Classically, I mean, and by that I mean the mathematics that everybody did um, before Brouwer and since, there are discontinuous functions, of course, like step functions. I don't know if you studied the calculus. If you did the Riemann integral, then you use step functions to approximate mm -hmm. the integral, right? You take the, you divide it up into sections, and then you, you take the, the step that gives you the value within that range, say take the value at the leftmost, uh, um, leftmost end of the interval and, and you get a step. And then you take finer and finer gradations and you, you generate, a, generate the integral for a given function under the area under the curve. Now, Brouwer didn't allow, and step functions are discontinuous. So Mm -hmm. That looks like a problem. But Brouwer's, well, I mean, there's the, how you develop the calculus without that. But, but at any rate, what you get out of Brouwer's approach is that every function is continuous. From every function from the real numbers into the real numbers is continuous. And why is that? Because in order to generate a value of the function from the input to the function, you need to be able to start approximating the output while you're approximating the input. If you have to wait till the whole input has been generated, then you'll never start generating the output, and you won't have a function on that conception. And that, that condition of generating the output to any degree of accuracy by generating the input to whatever it takes to generate that degree of accuracy, that is the epsilon delta definition of right. continuity. Right. So Brouwer's development of the calculus works with the conception that there, that all infinity is potential and not actual, and it gives you a very different mathematics because you only have continuous functions. You have no discontinuous functions. You don't get step functions, and you certainly don't get functions that people in the 19th century worried about, which are, say, zero on the rational numbers and one on the irrational numbers, you know, as completely non 
continuous as you could possibly have. Okay. However, on that conception, the continuum is not equinumerous with the natural numbers. It's an uncountable infinity. There is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the real numbers and the natural numbers. Now, on Brouwer's conception, there is no other infinity beyond that. But there is that. There are two sizes of infinity. So let's dive into this notion of the different sizes of infinity. Mm. Um, for me, because it's very hard for me to think about infinity in any other way than the way that I've been thinking about in terms of never ending. Mm -hmm. So the idea of different sizes. Well, that's Brouwer's conception. So what are the other conceptions then? So that what I want to explore is Cantor's conception, uh, or, or the. But Cantor I mean, I would like to get back to this point about how, on that conception, there is there are different sizes of infinity. There can be no one-to-one -one correspondence between natural numbers and the infinitely preceding sequences that generate the real numbers. But see, I, the thing is the infinitely preceding sequence, that's yeah. the thing that I would have issue with. So maybe this is where the strict well, finitizing... Well, perfectly good potential infinity? Well, I'm not sure because it depends on what we mean by potential infinity. This, ah. this is, oh, this is the thing where, where we were talking about earlier where it seems like it seems like in all of these circumstances when we're talking about one conception of infinity, another conception of infinity, and maybe I'm missing something here, but it seems like the conception of infinity, which implies never-endingness, mm -hmm. is seems to always be smuggled in. So when we talk about, like, re regardless, and maybe this will be elicited as we keep talking, but it seems like I have not, I, I have not grasped a full and complete conception of infinity that does not include or does not presuppose this concept of never-endingness, actual, like, never-endingness. But I thought you were, that was your notion of infinity, never-ending. What, what I'm saying is that is my conception, yeah. and what I don't understand is any other conception that doesn't okay, include well, that. Okay, never That's mind the, that, but I mean, I'm just saying, pointing out that if you accept that notion of infinity, you can't balk at the idea that there are different sizes of infinity. I can. No, because <laughs> Brouwer has exactly that. He has developed the theory of the continuum on the basis of infinity as potential and never actual, and he has two different sizes of infinity. The natural numbers and the real numbers but, are not equinumerous with each other. But I don't, what I would say is, I don't even think conceptually it makes sense to, to talk about sizes of infinity. Right. Well, I'm not, let's not talk about sizes of infinity. There is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the natural numbers and the real numbers. And see, that, again, this is my own, maybe this is radical, strict finitism. I don't think numbers work that way. I don't think when you're well, saying... That's a fact. Well, when you're saying one-to-one -one correspondence... Yes. Yes, I think that it is the case that all numbers are conceptually generated. And so... In other words, it's not like, like when we're talking about numbers, it's not that they're out there, right? They're not out there separate of our conception of them. Yeah. Right. So when you're saying. What? Every single number has to be thought about? There is. By somebody? By whom? There is no existence of a number outside of that number's conception. By it's, whom? Whoever's doing the conceiving, right? So. Well, who does the conceiving? Whoever's thinking about the topic. So if there were no. Well, the, how many numbers have you conceived of? I don't know. <laughs> well, this is, so we're, we're getting into the metaphysics of mathematics, which is really important. Okay, yes. um, so I, don't, it, I would say the, the same analogy to the Harry Potter and J.K. Rowling, that applies. Well, outside of anybody's conception, her mm. conception, our conception mm. of her characters, they have no existence whatsoever. Mm. And so that's, it doesn't sound like that would be... Fictionalism. Is, is that fictionalism? I think that's... What it's labeled as a philosophy of mathematics, as it were. Oh, oh, is that the case? That there this is, is part a, of a philosophy because fictionalism has a very specific meaning in philosophy, and I didn't think it was that. But I didn't realize that that term applied to mathematics. Yeah, there, as are, well. there are people who say that sort of thing. So, is it the case then that Brouwer, when we're talking, did not have this conception of numbers not existing outside of when somebody is thinking about them? Well, he has a theory of what he called the creating subject. Um, but um, it's idealized. You don't think, he didn't think it was him, and he didn't think it was you. Of course, he didn't know about you, but 
um, it wasn't some particular person who was doing the I, the imagining. Okay, well, th so does it sound, this is, so maybe this is the, uh, the underlying issue here. Wouldn't this be interesting? Perhaps this comes down to the philosophy of mathematics in terms of metaphysics. Is what your, is your conception of mathematics and perhaps Brower's and the majority of mathematicians' conceptions some type of Platonism? That there is some no, kind not. of... No, I'm opposed to Platonism. But, but don't you believe that there's numbers have some kind of existence separate of no. our conception of... No. Okay, well, it sounded like that's what you were just saying. No, I'm not. Okay, so what, so what was your... You don't, you're not objecting to what I was saying before about the idea of numbers having no kind of existence outside of when we think of them? Well, I... You're, the question is, what are the ways of thinking about them? And I've given you a way of thinking about, for example, the natural numbers, which you have balked at, but I'm telling you <laughs> how to think about the natural numbers, a way to yeah. think about the natural numbers in such a way that you can see what you can call the infinity of the natural numbers. Yes, but you're not thinking of all of the infinities, right? You're, you're thinking no, about not. what is the structure of yes, this type yes. of thing. And that does it. That does it. That's the way mathematics is. As Hilbert said, mathematics is a symphony of the infinite. How can we have this symphony? Well, by understanding these properties. We're not limited to step-by-step uh, step generating this and this and this. We wouldn't get anywhere. We would never have had mathematics. If the conception you're talking about yeah. is good for six-year-olds when they're learning <laughs> to count, but it's not good for mathematics. We would never have had professional mathematics on that conception. Well, I don't disagree with that, but that doesn't necessarily mean... So you mean... think all professional mathematics is misguided? If that is the conclusion, I mean, that's what I, the position I would be forced into, I suppose. But Doesn't but, that worry you? Uh, well, I don't think it's the case that uh, just because there's a large discipline of people engaging in a certain practice, that therefore their method of approaching their area of study is correct. I think you can have fundamental misconceptions in different areas of thought. Okay. Yes, I would say that. But, but is that is that the stakes that we're talking about here? If, if what I'm talk if if what I'm saying is true about kind of the metaphysics of mathematics, does it imply then that professional mathematicians have been sure? <laughs> That's what it implies. Okay. Well. Uh, when, so when you said, well, let's explore that just for a little bit more. When you said you wouldn't have professional mathematicians, um, are you saying that this is, is this a modern development? So is the way that I'm conceiving about infinity, is this something that would have been entertained prior, let's say, to the, the 20th century or maybe prior to the 19th century? Or are we talking for the last 2,000 years we wouldn't have developments? No, I mean, of, your conception goes, is fine with Aristotle. That's what he was saying. And um, arguably, mathematics, until the first part of the 19th century, um, was fine with it, because that's how people thought. So, but mathematicians got beyond that. So what I need to do is just go back to the 19th century, essentially. Well, I mean, if you, st you mean study what they did. Well, you well, studied, I don't know. Yeah. I think a, a very important aspect of the philosophy of mathematics is to be sensitive to what mathematicians do. Right. That's the guiding And do you think it's condition. Do you think it would be presumptuous to say, well, given this error in conceptions of infinity that I perceive or conceive of, the way that mathematicians have been doing their practice for the last 100, 150 years is fundamentally wrong? Do you think that is just completely presumptuous? Do you know of anybody, from my own uh, reference here, do you know of anybody uh, who would say that in terms of modern mathematics? No, I mean the thing is that the, the great example of doing that is Brouwer. Okay. I don't know, do you know, how much yes. do you know of very, work? very little, just actually from the book I was talking about, um, Morris Klein's book, he talks about oh, Brouwer's see. work. Yes, yeah. yes. But Brouwer was an intuitionist, was he not? Yes, yes, yes. yes. I mean that's what he called his position. The, the, so you might find this interesting or maybe ridiculous, but um, and maybe this will be kind of in wrapping it up because I don't want to take, keep you for too long. Um, what I find very persuasive about intuitionism is the rejection of uh, 
infinite sets. And sure, the sure, of that. sure. That. What I think they get wrong uh. is they conceive of logic as being something that is uh, non, perhaps you could say non-universal, or in the sense that it's not. Like this is this my own position. If I could try to historically put it somewhere, is somewhere between logicism and intuitionism, because I think that everything can ultimately be reduced to the laws of logic. Mm -hmm. I do think that is true, oh. but I don't think intu I mean intuitionists wouldn't say that, right? No, I mean Brower says that explicitly. Yes, he says logic is not a means by which to establish a truth which is not establishable in some other way. Right, and so my position is the mission is the merging of the two. It's the logicism with the idea, with the, the metaphysics of intuitionism. <laughs> All right, so, and I, as far as I know, there's a group of one of us. Okay, <laughs> well, good luck. But on that note, I really want to thank you for sitting down and speaking with me. This has been, yeah, this has been very great. interesting. Okay, so that was my interview with Dr. Isaacson of Oxford University. I hope you enjoyed that, and at the very least, maybe you think I'm a complete crank, and if that's the case, you're not alone. I think there's room for discussion in talking about the foundations of mathematics. I don't think it's completely unreasonable to say that maybe what numbers are is just ideas. They're just concepts in our head. Mathematical relationships are logical relationships. They're conceptual relationships. That's it. They don't have any kind of existence outside of our mind. That doesn't mean mathematics doesn't apply to the real world. In fact, quite the contrary. It just means that the actual mathematical units, as they exist, are fundamentally conceptual in nature. And if that's so, it restricts what we can and cannot say about them. At the very least, I think that's a reasonable and entertainable position, but it stands radically opposed to professional mathematicians of the last century. Make of that as you will. And as always, eventually I will be doing an interview breakdown of this episode because I think there's just so much meat here to talk about. So that's it for me. Hope you guys enjoyed it and have a fantastic week.